Monarch butterflies are widely known for their beautiful warm toned wings and their migration. They travel back and forth from Mexico to the U.S. in search for a safer place to spend the winter. The key word here is safer place. Just like monarch butterflies, immigrants come to the States in search for a better life and to escape the harsh environments from home. But along that search comes a long journey. Despite that, both the monarch butterfly and immigrants persevere. On today's show, we'll be hearing inspiring stories from young immigrants and dive deep into how local organizations help this community. All this coming up on Dreams of the Monarch Butterfly. I'm your host, Yuseli Flores. Joining me today are Maria Tijerina and Trisha Young from local nonprofit Voces de la Frontera and school-based organization Youth Empowered in the Struggle. How are you two doing today? Doing well. Good. It's good to be here. Good. Thanks for being here. Can you tell me a little bit more about Voces and YES? Yes. So I am the current Youth Empowered in the Struggle, or YES, organizer of Milwaukee. Um, and YES is really a student-led organization that navigates and tries to pick, pinpoint injustices that students see in their school and community. Um, YES started in 2003 in Racine in Horlick High School. That's actually how I became uh, involved with YES a few years later. Um, and it really centered around driver's license issues and in-state tuition issues um, for students and immigrants around Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. The organization sort of grew and in 2003, um, YES met Christine Newman Ortiz, mm -hmm. who is the founder of Voces de la Frontera. Um, the two organizations kind of merged and became like a very strong force in Wisconsin. Thanks, Trisha. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be taking more time to talk with both of you about the youth-led organization. But now, let's take a look at a local immigration story from international student, Nolwin Guilarte. Vengo de Venezuela y mi país es bello en toda la extensión de la palabra. Mi país ha estado pasando por tiempos difíciles gracias a las decisiones que ha tomado el gobernador y el presidente más que todo, lo que me obligó a salir del país y quería hacerlo de la manera legal posible. Este, entonces apliqué para una escuela aquí en los Estados Unidos y esperé a ser aceptado. Y una vez que fui aceptado, apliqué para una visa de estudiante y a través de la visa de estudiante fue que yo pude venir. Pues hay, cons, hay como sus contrarias y sus cosas positivas de ambas, pero realmente es que Estados Unidos es más como una oportunidad para mí pero sí me ha gustado bastante Venezuela. Es dura, como cualquier otra, ya que al ser estudiante no se me permite trabajar, a menos de que esté relacionado con mi, este, con mi carrera o esté como parte del programa de educación, lo que me limita de muchas otras maneras, ya que no puedo trabajar fuera del field o más de una cantidad de ciertas horas. No estás ilegal, pero tampoco puedes trabajar algo que, tú, que esté fuera de tu carrera porque pues, es la manera en que el gobierno dice es parte de tu carrera, estás aprendiendo. Eso es la limitación que tiene esa barrera de estudiante internacional. Es difícil, pero es en cierta manera mejor que simplemente una visa de turista. Y realmente hay que saberla aprovechar. Ya que estoy aquí solo, no tengo mis padres o 
alguien que pues me apoye realmente aquí, sino que siempre he tenido yo que buscar la manera de cómo hacerme amistad con las personas y ver cómo ellos también me pueden ayudar a conseguir cosas y muchas personas han sido bellas conmigo, me han ayudado, pero también otras me han impactado de una manera negativa, pero se sí, ha sido difícil. Realmente tener a mi familia y tener la oportunidad de pues, a ser más libre al momento de poder trabajar en diferentes áreas. Porque ya cuando uno es joven uno quiere aprender de todo y realmente eso es lo bonito de la vida, aprender. As of 2021, international students represent about 4.6% of the nearly 20 million college students in the U.S. Amidst the 2020 pandemic, a lot of health concerns arose through racism and xenophobic political ends. Especially in July of 2020, when new ICE rules stated that foreign students would lose their immigration status due to universities going fully online and would be at risk of deportation. How similar is the college struggle for undocumented students and foreign students? The college struggle for both is very similar. Um, if you are undocumented or a foreign student, this means you do not have access to in-state tuition or even financial aid, which can make navigating higher education very difficult. As someone who was previously undocumented and is a first-generation student myself, it was very hard to navigate higher education. I remember applying for colleges just my senior year, and in the school I went to, no one really knew what to do with me. No one had really handled a case of someone being undocumented applying for higher education. Um, and it's really surprising because I will be graduating in May, and this is definitely nothing that the, I never saw this um, before, and it's just really exciting that I'm finally able to take control of my future. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. I can definitely relate as a first-generation immigrant student myself, and I'm sure your parents are really proud. Um, did, were they always supportive throughout, the, um, throughout your experience? or? Yes, so I've always been supportive. I just remember being in high school and it's not that they didn't believe I could get into college. They just were really honest just from the get-go. I mean, when I came to the U.S. at five, I knew I was undocumented from a young age. Mm -hmm. um, so they were just very honest and didn't want me to get my hopes up. Thankfully, I was able to figure out the process and I'll be the first one graduating in my family, which is very exciting. And I'm just happy to be able to represent them and like make them proud. That's amazing. Well, let's take a look at another inspirational story from Idahoan first generation immigrant Roseli Guerrero. I was five years old when I came to the U.S. Um, we, when we crossed, um, we, our first place of residence was in California actually, um, before we came to Idaho. So my parents wanted a better life for us, better opportunities. Um, I was the only child um, at that point, and they just really wanted me to have a better education. They just came here um, to have better opportunities and um, you know, a better life than what they could have given me um, back in our home country at that time. I think I always like knew I was undocumented, but it wasn't until high school when like the reality finally hit. Um, I know that there was, you know, like here in Idaho, you're unable to get a driver's license if you're undocumented. So there was a lot of my friends that were taking driver's ed, they were already getting their license, they were getting a job, and I couldn't do that. And that's when it was like really hitting me or when there was school field trips to go to New York um, and I wasn't able to go to that. Um, so that's when it really, like, the st my status started, like, impacting me. And um, reality hit, knowing that I'm undocumented and there are those barriers. So it was hard. And I think that conversation also about going to college started happening. And I was like, well, you know, I, I got into a really bad headspace of being like, well, why am I even going to go to college? Like, I'm not even going to be able to get a job. How am I even going to pay for college? Um, so my mental health at that point, it was just not that great. And just the mentality that I had was like, well, it's not even worth it. Like, why even go to college? Why even do all of these things? Like, if there's going to be these barriers.
it was just it was just all of the things and it, it was really hard to to really like re redefine like try to redefine and like really change like that perspective and be like okay I have control of like who I am you know like if I'm undocumented if I'm a dreamer like I need to start taking control of like what that means to me right um so yeah it, it definitely took some how you like some soul searching uh to really get into like that right path and be like with or without a social number with or without um you know legal status it's like I still matter and everybody matters So the Butterfly Migration Project uh, is very dear to my heart because, um, so I work at the ACLU of Idaho and um, this project started because I started working on this project called Documented. Um, like I said, I feel like there's a lot of uh, misinformation about what, a, what DACA is or who a DACA recipient is. So at that time, I started interviewing folks that were DACA recipients here in Idaho to share and amplify their stories. Um, because of that project, um, it transformed to the Butterfly Migration Project. So during um, the Trump era, um, I know that, you know, here in Boise or even like around the state, across the state, um, there was a lot of, it felt very hostile for our community, right? During that, during that era. So uh, I thought about the butterflies, right? Butterflies represent resilience for our community and strength and perseverance. Um, so we did butterflies, um, paper butterflies, where we wrote what DACA is, um, resources for DACA, where people could find more information. And then on one of the, the wings, we had people write quotes or like some words of encouragement for our DACA recipients. And then we put it um, in different businesses um, in Boise. So we got around, I think in two weeks, we got around 300 butterflies that um people in the community yeah people in the community created and it was just great like to see people be like oh like we went to so and so business just to see the butterflies uh and it was it was just amazing and i was like okay now let's make it bigger right because this you know this goes beyond just daca because you know daca we have been on, in a limbo for so long with no way for us for a pathway to citizenship but just as much as we're deserving for a pathway to citizenship, so are other undocumented folks that don't have the privilege for DACA. According to USCIS, more than 610,000 DREAMers make up the current DACA population. As of October 2022, DHS rules allow DACA renewal applications, but will not grant or even process current first-time applications. Can you tell me more about what DACA really is and what it means? Yes, so DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and it was a policy that was implemented under Obama's administration via an executive order. So it grants eligible and documented immigrants who entered the U.S. as children access to a two-year period of um, two-year period of deferred action against deportation, along with a work permit and access to a social security number. And DACA was basically the product of countless of years. Um, of, of youth and immigration youth and the DREAMers movement. Mm -hmm. um, and as we mentioned, no current applications are being accepted. And today DACA remains in limbo as it is currently being contested in the courts. And yeah. yeah. So why is it very devastating that first time applicants can't apply anymore? It is devastating because you feel as if you're living in the shadows. Mm -hmm. um, I was undocumented for the majority of my life and my parents came to the U.S. and I entered when I was five. Mm -hmm. So this is all I've ever known. And I remember for the majority of my life feeling like I was in an invisible cage. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to get attached to anything out of fear of having to let it go, which mm -hmm. is very sad because just being undocumented in the U.S. is means being deportable. Mm -hmm. And being deportable means that you may have to leave a country that you've called home for the majority of your life. Wow, I'm sorry, that's devastating. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, Trisha, Rosselli talks about um, her butterfly project being centered around May Day. Um, can you tell me more about May Day and what it is? Yeah, so <coughs> May Day started actually about 130 years ago wow. um, here in the U.S. with the fight for an eight-hour workday. Mm -hmm. Since then, it's kind of grown into an interna the International Workers' Rights Day. 
Um, and during this day, we encourage workers, students to take off um, to show their solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, here in Milwaukee, VOSIS centers that kind of story around um, not only workers and students, but especially Latino, Latinx, mm -hmm. the Latinx community. And when they all come out for these marches, um, the communities really see, our schools see what it's like to have Latinos out of school, out of work, mm -hmm. and every, and all laborers, really. Wow, so aside from May Day, what other campaigns are VOSIS or YES working on right now? Uh, yeah, we have a few very important campaigns. Um, at a statewide level, mm -hmm. VOSIS is currently working on, still working on driver's licenses for all, mm -hmm. um, which presents a real, um, block in the in communities of immigrant immigrants um, because if you don't have a driver's license how do you get to work how do you pick up your children how do you run errands um, it's a it's a human rights issue that's very important they are also working on 287 G mm -hmm. which deputizes local law enforcement to act as ice agents so they can arrest and detain uh, undocumented people um, so we're currently fighting against that wow. And as a, at a local city level, YES right now is currently focusing on their school lunch justice mm -hmm. campaign here in Milwaukee, which is getting a lot of traction and we actually were able to set up a task force in, um, for MPS, um, which will hopefully kind of lead the way to get healthier food, to get local food, um, to get students with dietary and religious restrictions, their needs met during lunch. A lot of Milwaukee students only get one meal a day and that might be their school lunch. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think mm -hmm. that's really important that that's, uh, you know, campaigns that you're really passionate about and working on with the youth. Um, well, there are many ways that a person can get involved, whether it's supporting May Day or student rights, especially for young adults. For our last segment, let's take a look at local immigration story from Elisa Alvarez Garcia. Guadalajara, Jalisco, and from what I've been told, I was brought here when I was probably a couple months old. It mostly started in high school when, you know, we would have like these trips and, you know, they would say like, oh, you could travel out the U.S. if, you know, you have your passport and everything. And I would ask my mom or like, you know, we would start getting jobs and she was like, you really can't do that. And then it kind of would start to hit me. I wouldn't have the same privilege as the rest. It was more, more of a fear because this is all the life I know. You know, it's like I went to school here, I know the proper, and how do I say this? I've grown accustomed to this life and I feel like I could survive if I was made to go back but I wouldn't have exactly the same opportunities or because you always hear stories about like I love where I'm from but I hear that you know women don't exactly have the same amount of prestige that we do here or the same amount of opportunities. I feel like I've learned to accept it but I feel like at times when you let people know exactly what your status is, they kind of see you a little less of a person. And when you try to explain, like, you know, they'll be like, oh, let's take a trip here. And you kind of have to step back. Like, unfortunately, I can't go with you. Or at the time I was in school, there was certain like grants or scholarships that I wasn't being able to have because of my status. Or colleges, even if I've lived here, you know, the 20 plus years. I still had to pay out of state, which kind of made life a little bit more difficult. So I think it's hard for them to understand because others to understand our situation compared to the rest because they're, to them, is like second thought, you know, they don't have to worry about, you know, possibly losing their legal status or being able to continue working because they have it, you know, like, as someone who constantly has to show, like with DACA, you know, it's like you're constantly have to worry on the news, like, is it going to be canceled? 
you know, you have to save in case it's not, you know, your future is always kind of in the mist. Don't quit. Don't quit. I don't care what anyone says, don't quit. You know, you're making your own future. There is more ways to get legal than just what everyone tells you to get married. You know, you can get a prestige job. They can vouch for you. It's not the end. It's hard. It's really hard. But there is a way and we will find a way. It's amazing to hear these kind messages from others who have gone through the same struggle. As an undocumented immigrant myself, I can definitely relate with you, Maria, about struggling through the education system. Is there any other hope you'd like to share for folks who might be in the same limbo as us? I would like to say that we deserve a right to dream. You know, we've established ourselves in this country and it is our home as much as mm -hmm. others would like to say it's not. So again, like the video said, you know, just keep going and really fighting for what you want because you more than deserve it. Thank you. And Trisha, you talked about um, the different campaigns that VOSIS and YES are involved in. I know that there's an election coming up, a primary on February 21st, and then uh, April 4th is the actual election, and I'm sure YES and VOSIS are doing something about that, so would you like to maybe share with us and how we can get involved? Yeah, so um, every year for local and uh, larger elections, uh, YES does get out the vote, mm -hmm. which they knock on thousands of doors. Um, and tell people in an, um, to go and vote. They tell them their location, their polling location, um, and it's a non, it's a nonpartisan mm -hmm. effort. So they're not telling people who to vote for. They're just telling people who have, in communities with low voter turnout, to go and vote. You know, mm -hmm. to tell people to give voice to the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. um, we have a super voceros program at Vosis which really empowers specifically immigrants and people who can't vote to kind of start the dialogue with their coworkers, their friends, their family, um, just their community um, to really empower themselves and tell people to vote and to vote on their behalf. Um, so yeah, there's, there's many ways to get involved in that. And we also have to remember um, to hold these politicians accountable once we elect them to office, um, to be a thorn in, the, in their side, really, um, and to continue that effort. Thanks. Well, I really appreciate having you both here to talk about such an important organization in Milwaukee. I hope this encourages a lot of young adults to ne never give up on their dreams y seguir echándole ganas. We as immigrants are essential and we provide a lot for this country. I'm your host, Yuseli Flores. Thank you for joining me today on Dreams of the Monarch Butterfly. <laughs>